Me fumble them, crucial, crucial, Audi body. All right, let's just break it down. Me fumble them, my family, my people. Una crucial. What's up? Howdy body, how's your body? Well, you wouldn't say how's your body. That just sounds wrong. But it's basically saying how you doing? What's cracking? So get used to that because we're gonna be using that all the time. It's a taste of where I'm from, Sierra Leone. It's called Creole or Creole, as some people would say. Apparently there are like six million reasons why I should hate this camera. Well, because of time and we only have 24 hours in a day and my battery might just run off as well. Let's just look at six. So, the Sony RX100 Mark III. Now, when this camera came out in 2014, people were excited, especially the enthusiasts, and also people who wanted something to have on the go on holidays, a camera that was capable and can fit in your pocket, one of the reasons why I bought it anyway. Um, you're talking about a 24 to 70 lens. It had a fast aperture of 1.8 to 2.8, a Zeiss lens, mmm, Zeiss. Everybody wants a Zeiss lens. And most of all, the codec was fantastic. But hey, four years on, 2018, can it still stand the test of time? Let's look at the negatives. Reason number one why I should hate my RX100, Sony menu systems. It could be a bit daunting sometimes, especially for new users coming into the Sony platform or just generally people who are new and coming into photography. The Panasonics have been notorious for just being simple and beautifully laid out and things are more simple. Even the Canon, Canon has one of the most easy to understand menu system. With the Sony, it's kind of like you're doing a small exam and it goes through pages and pages and I kind of understand what they're saying. Reason number two, they say the wheel, which is basically the mode wheel that you use to like move around the menus, apparently is a bit clunky. Reason number three, the menu again, but this time it's not just the fact that it's like really clustered. It has a way of limiting you in certain modes. For example, if you're in shooting mode A and you wanna like change your picture profiles, well, picture effects, you could get some limitation and some weird messages might come on. Another example is if you're in movie mode and shutter priority mode, you can't really change your focus area. I also realized that when you're in like the memory mode, which is a cool feature that I'll talk about later, you can't really use the remote. Reason number four, the EVF. Whenever you open the EVF, ooh, nice. But then if you close the EVF and you wanna use like the flip up screen, it shuts down the camera and you have to put the camera on again. And if you have to use the EVF again, maybe you're in a sunny situation and you wanna be able to use the EVF to know whether you're in focus and to check your exposure. You wanna use the screen, you flip it, it's gonna go off again. It's gonna go off again and again and again and again. And I can see how that could be irritating. This is something that could have been sorted by a software update. In four and five, it's been sorted, no problem. But under three, that could be a bit of a doddle. Reason number five, the focus. Now, this camera has contrast detection. We can spend a whole day talking about phase detection. Contrast detection basically means the sense of the camera works out the contrast in the scene. So like my t-shirt is black, my face is kind of browny. If I was to raise a white tapey thing, where's my white tapey thing? There's obviously a contrast between the white tapey thing and my skin. So because of that, the mechanism in the sensor would use this interesting technology with all that processing and we'll be able to focus. Now, the thing about that is it's not as quick as the phase detection. The phase detection is a whole new ball game. Sometimes it does it fantastically. It's like it has a mind of its own, but sometimes it's so excited to see the face because it also has face recognition, which is really cool. Like right now that is on and it's like just tracking me with the box or wherever my face goes. It kind of sticks on there, but if I was to do that, is it focused? So my hand is not a, okay, it's kind of, you see what I mean. And finally, reason number six why I should hate this camera, it doesn't have a touch screen. All right, the Canon G7X Mark II has a touch screen and it's cool. In a way you can do really cool things like touching to focus, you can touch there, focus there, and you can like rack focus by touching down. So with all these reasons why I should hate it, do I hate it really? Uh, nah. If I could be the advocate for the RX100 Mark III for a minute. The menu is daunting and it's clustered and it has so much to go through. Blah, blah. But this is how I think about it. For me, the menu is functional. 
It shows the six million ways that you could tweak this camera to get what you want. And you know what the cool thing is? There is also memory banks, three memory banks. So you don't have to go through the menu every time doing the same thing. So for example, this setting, I, I know what my lighting is, I know what my positioning is, and my focus. I put the camera on, I go to memory one, bam, and everything is there. And if I need to do any movements or any tweaks, it's really minimal. Maybe just maybe the lighting situation, maybe I'm shooting during the day and there's slightly more light hitting me through the window or something that I can just reduce my ISO or maybe shut down my iris a little bit. It still works. And if there's anything at all that still confuses you in the menu that you have to go through, you just need to press the C button and you'll be able to actually see a little description pop up like and then it'll explain what that does. Reason number two was the wheel is too clunky. Yes, it's not gonna be the smoothest, most effective robotic wheel in the world, but it's just a wheel, man. I use the wheel to go around and increase my aperture and my shutter speed when I need to. I think that's just nitpicking. It's not gonna destroy your life or make you not achieve the cinematography that you dreamt of. It's just a wheel. And yes, the menu can be limiting in some settings, but I think once you understand how the camera works, also, when you think about it, there's certain things you don't really need when you're in certain shooting modes. A simple example of that is scene selection mode. In macro mode on the scene selection, the camera naturally fixes certain parameters so that you'll be able to get a macro shot of something. So if you wanna shoot a little insect or a plant, the camera would lock down certain settings because you're not gonna be needing those settings. The whole point why they have scene selection is because it's going to select the scene and change the parameters just for you so that you can do macro without thinking and scratching your head on how to set it to get the best exposure or the best level of lighting for that scene. When you come to think about it, there's a method to the madness. So I forgive Sony for that. The EVF, yes. The EVF will shut down the camera every time you close it. But here's the thing, instead of thinking the EVF is irritating, how about thanking God that you have an EVF in the first place? Yes, it's a small eyepiece thingy, Bob. It's not like you have like this big eye cover that goes on your eye and you can watch it like you're watching a 3D cinema. No, come on guys. If I'm doing outdoor shoots, being in where we're from, West Africa, the sun is always almost high up in the sky. Sometimes you don't have the luxury to wait for 6 p.m. when the sun is down and you know you have a, a nice sunsetty, soft sky, sunsetty thingy. What am I saying? Anyway, what I'm trying to say is there have been times when the sun is really high up in the sky and I wasn't able to get my exposure right by looking at the screen. So what I do instead of just limiting the EVF for shooting stills, which is cool because you can just pop it up and shoot stills. Even for video, I use the EVF, wait for it, as a reference monitor. So what I do is I pop up the EVF, check my exposure, knowing that, okay, based on the scene that I'm shooting, the exposure is right. Exposure, exposure. The exposure is right. And then I put down my EVF. Yes, it's gonna shut the camera off, but you just press the one button. All you need to do is press the button once and the camera will come on again. And then when I open the screen, even if I don't see exactly what I was able to see in the EVF, I'm confident knowing that I have the right exposure. Thanks to what? <gasps> the EVF. So it's actually a cool thing. And yes, we all wish that it had phase detection. Phase detection is the way to go. The Mac 4 and the Mac 5 have phase detection, beautiful. I don't know, maybe one day I'll upgrade to that just for phase detection. But you know what? It's cool. I work around my contrast. And it doesn't have a touch screen, so what? The good thing is the controllers and the camera are capable enough for me to move through the screen effectively and quick enough for me to do it. And as long as I have my stuff set in a memory bank and I know exactly what I want, I'm not gonna be going doop, doop every time I try to touch the screen. You know that when you're using your phone, your phone is a touch screen, but I think we have enough touch screen things in our lives to not feel offended for a camera not to have touch screen. More good things about the RX100 Mark III Frame rate, I can actually shoot 60 frames a second at 1080p. Even a 5D Mark III Canon can do that. In fact, I can shoot 120 frames per second at 720p. For social media stuff, Instagram, I don't need even 1080. So this camera is cool in that respect. Another fantastic thing about this camera is the codec. 50 megabytes per second at 1080. Yeah. So hey, you're gonna get a good crispy image and it's also in XAVC format. We, I, Look at it, this is it. I can even do my custom white balance with this camera. I can check my scene out, analyze the data, data, tomato, tomato. And then it's gonna give you a custom white balance based on the lighting in the room. That's awesome. Also, clear image zoom. A lot of people, oh, it's only a 24 to 70. But clear image zoom gives you 3.6 times more zoominess. <laughs> zoominess, anise. 
Yeah, but you understand. The zoom gets 3.6 times more. So in a way, you're also getting more out of the lens, which is fantastic. Now, one of my greatest features of this camera, it has a three-stop ND filter. Now think about it. A three-stop ND filter in a small camera like that. That is a savior because you could just bring that ISO all the way down and you can still keep your cinematic shooting by keeping your shutter speed at 150th, which is really cool. So that's something else to be happy about. It has an ND filter built in. Tiltable screens are bay. When you're doing vlogging, that's a lifesaver. Even now I can flip my screen and I can just like get a, a nice framing knowing what I'm seeing. I know Panasonic is the king for that with a flippy thingy screen. So my conclusions. It's important to know what your purpose is and what you want to do with your camera or your gear. Now for me, I sat down, thought about my budget and thought about the purpose. I knew I wanted to start my vlog. I knew I needed a camera that was going to help me travel easy, like a, an all-in-one camera that I could use to like do these talking head stuff and also travel with it and be able to have enough capability to shoot outside. Now, I'm saying this and you're like, wait, wait, what's the big deal? You could have different cameras. Yes, you could if you have the budget. But also for me, it was important to get a camera that is incognito-ish enough. For example, when we went to Nairobi, uh, me and my boy a couple of months back, he almost got arrested for using an Osmo, an Osmo. You know, so that's, that's crazy. You can't even vlog in airports in some parts of Africa. I'm a witness. It's impossible for me to take a 7D like this vlogging. They will think, oh, hey, look here. Why are you doing that? Come here. Eh? <laughs> and I can understand. The situation in certain countries is, is different from other countries. Like Kenya has had a, a terrorist attack when they, they had one of their malls blown up and hundreds, hundreds of people lost their lives. So I get it. What am I trying to say? For me, this camera was deliberate because I needed something that if peradventure I want to bring it out somewhere in public and do something, it could actually be dismissed for just a little toy camera or maybe just one of these little things. It's, it's just less intimidating. And budget is important. Some people have unlimited budget. They could just walk into a store and say, I want that, I want that and that. And yeah, that's not where I am right now. I, for example, when I was buying my camera, I didn't just buy the camera. I had to invest in some other stuff for my music production. Always understand what you need to achieve and also depending on what your budget is. There's always peer pressure to just get equipment. You know, it's like being in the boys urinal in secondary school, you know, like, hey, check out my guns, man. Mine is bigger than yours. But just focus on what you need to achieve. Buy what you can afford within your budget. If a telephone is all you have right now, research on how to shoot on your telephone. So many use their phones to chat on WhatsApp, yet your phone can shoot 4K. I mean, literally the cutaways of this video were shot on my iPhone 6. So, would I recommend the RX100 Mark III? Definitely. I think it's a great camera for the time it came out. I still think it's relevant to today. And I think it's a fantastic vlogging camera. Am I going to invest in another camera later? Yes, I'm building my arsenal gradually. But for now, this is what I have. And as the saying goes, the best camera is the camera that you have in your hand. This is where I'm gonna end for this episode. Thanks for hanging out with me. Because of you guys, I can do this. And I'm so excited. Thanks for hanging with me. Like this video if it's helped you in any way or it's inspired you to do stuff with a little camera that is in your pocket or whatever you have. If it's really irritated you, then it's your right, man. You can hit the unlike button. But if you wake up tomorrow and you think, actually, this video wasn't bad at all then please hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel and you'd like to get like updates on what's going on and new videos, hit the subscribe button. I'd appreciate that. The more the merrier and we can share together. Thank you so much. This is your boy Anis Holloway saying, peace out. <laughs>